Today we are speaking on eating and tolerating more good gut fiber for IBS, SIBO, and beyond. We're really excited with this topic. This is something we really, really love to discuss. We're going to be talking a little bit more about ourselves and what we do. We're going to be talking about gut issues like IBS and SIBO, how to restore the gut, whether you are looking to prevent, whether you're looking to help with IBS and SIBO and beyond. We're going to be talking about our mantra, which is heal with each meal. That is our tagline that really encompasses what we do as a practice and what we're all about. We're going to talk about feel with each meal because nutrition is a big puzzle piece, but it's one of the pieces. It's not everything. We're going to go over some real patients of ours as case studies so you can see real world examples. So we're excited. So more about us. Again, you know who we are. And we are also co-founders of Married to Health. Married to Health is an outpatient private practice where we have seven other registered dietitians, all integrative and all with different specialties to help patients and people all around the world. And so we're all that. virtual, so we can, mm -hmm. in essence, work with anyone, anywhere, at any time. Yes. And we've been doing this for a while. We ourselves are plant-based. We've been plant-based for 12 years. We have a family. We run our practice. And we really, really enjoy being registered dietitians and taking an integrative approach. And we've been registered dietitian for dietitians for 10 of those 12 years. So it's yes. been a journey. First, we were figuring it out on our own. And as we were using evidence, we continued to optimize plant-based nutrition and then figured out how important it was to the gut. And one of the things we like to say is we truly believe gut health is the nexus of all health on the planet. So not just the nexus of all health for your body, but for the entire planet. And why we say this is because we truly believe the gut microbiome is your inner ecosystem. And when it comes to ecosystems, we think it's the most important ecosystem on this planet. So it has ripple effects, which we'll get into. Because as you may know, you are fiber fueling, right? You're here, you're fiber fueled or you're fiber ready or you're ready to dive in or you've been diving in and eating more fiber. And maybe you're just like, you know what? I'm still feeling bloated. I have excessive gas, which gas is okay. It's okay to fart. Farts are friends, we say. But, you know, when it's excessive or it's foul smelling, right? It kind of smells like rotten eggs. Uh, you have constipation, diarrhea, reflux, nausea, early satiety where you're just like, I don't have an appetite and you're not feeling well while incorporating that fiber, that kind of sends off a little red flag. And maybe that's not you. Maybe you've been fiber fueling and you're like, fiber fueling changed my life. I eat the fiber. I tolerate the fiber. But I know that one person who's been experiencing these things. I'm preaching fiber fuel to everybody. And I do have some people who are telling me, oh man, I'm trying it and I'm mm -hmm. still having these symptoms. Or sometimes Fiber really brings out those symptoms if there were issues there to begin with. So we're going to be breaking all that down for you today. And the reason why we talk about the inner ecosystem and try to simplify it, because it, it can be pretty simple, but getting into the complex, we also have to understand that our world around us is making it a little bit more difficult to have a healthy gut. And that is backed by a lot of research and a lot of science. So when we talk about something like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, there are many factors that can play into an IBS diagnose, diagnosis. So genetic predisposition, immune system issues, psychological factors and emotional factors, right? alterations in the gut microbiota, like the population, right? We call that dysbiosis. We can have changes in motility. We can have change in the gut brain axis, whether it's through injury or a chemical like medication. And the list goes on and on. One of my favorites is environmental pollution. Not that it's my favorite, but it's my favorite topic where really our environment has a drastic impact on shaping our gut for the good, but also for the not so good. So very important to be aware of these things. So maybe you have experienced one or more of those things James just mentioned. Maybe you have had environmental exposures. You do have genetic predisposition. You do have early adverse childhood events. You have had poor diet in the past. We're going to talk about what that can lead to. And we do know that IBS, aka irritable bowel syndrome, is something that we're starting to see more and more in the population. In fact, one in seven Americans, or about 15% of Americans, have been diagnosed with IBS. We do know that over 30 people, over 30% 30 of people who experience IBS symptoms, 
consult a physician, meaning there's probably more than 70% of those with IBS diagnosed or undiagnosed who don't even seek help. Mm. Um, and we do know that IBS is a GI condition that causes changes in abdominal pain or discomfort and changes in bowel habits. So that can alter um, diarrhea, constipation. Somebody might have IBSC, IBS with constipation, IBS with diarrhea. They could have mixed where they say, I have both. Some days I'm constipated, then I have diarrhea all of a sudden. And then there are also those who might not experience a change in their bowel habits, but they still have the discomfort. So they're in one of those uncategorized IBS types. And um, IBS is called a disease of exclusion. So that means that you see a gastroenterologist, they do all the scopes, they do all the tests, you don't have celiac disease, you don't have food allergies, you don't have any polyps or colitis, you don't have esophagitis, but you still have this irritable bowel, right? You're still in discomfort, you still have abnormal bowel habits. So that's where you fall under that umbrella of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, we do know that IBS is also called a disorder of the gut-brain connection, that gut-brain access is off where maybe there's misfired signals, maybe there's too much information going one way, but the gut-brain connection is having some trouble in its communication. And we do know that a majority of those with IBS, 60 to 65% are female. We do know that our hormones as females like estrogen make our nerves more sensitive to changes in bloating and distension. And we also do know there was one really incredible study that showed that over 76% of the people polled in this group reported that they had an adverse childhood event in their early ages. So before seven years old, 76% of these people experienced early adverse childhood trauma. And that's really going to play into those first thousand days of life, which shape the gut microbiome. And that can certainly distinguish how the gut is going to function. When we're talking IBS, there's three major factors that usually are off. One may have one of these factors that's off, one may have all three of them, or maybe two of them. One of the biggest ones that we're hearing a lot about, and Dr. B talks about often, is dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is an imbalance of who is living in the gut and or where they're living in the gut. So dysbiosis doesn't necessarily mean you have overabundance of inflammatory microbes. They can be perfectly healthy, anti-inflammatory, helpful commensal bacteria and other gut bugs, but maybe they just made their way up into the wrong area. Instead of being highly populated in the end of the GI tract in the colon or the large intestine, perhaps they figured out how to open up the little door called the ileocecal valve that you have here between your right hip and belly button. Maybe they're like, hey, I made my way into the small intestine food party. I'm gonna be feasting and fe festing on all of this. And I'm gonna be giving this person a bunch of gas and bloat and discomfort. Um, so that can be dysbiosis. We know that this can be induced by so many things, but some of the most common things are um, antibiotic use, overuse of antibiotics. If you're an 80s, 90s kid like we are, you probably were part of that generation where it was like, why would you go to the doctor if they weren't gonna give you an antibiotic for every sniffle and cough and any little thing that you had. Um, pesticides, as James mentioned, yeah. the environment can play a huge role. And if these pesticides can get rid of pests outside, imagine what they can do to our gut bugs inside. And they're never pests, but they can be altered by this. Um, gums and emulsifiers or binders that are in food, anything that's going to bind oil to water, think salad dressings, peanut butters, that can bind to your healthy gut bugs as well. Stress, Food poisoning can cause dysbiosis, huge one. Um, traveler's diarrhea, and then issues with motility. So all these, again, can cause an imbalance of who is living in what area of the gut. That is dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. We also have dysmotility. So, yep, yeah, and this is the second thing that can happen that can be a precursor to IBS or a further condition that we'll get into called SIBO. But dysmotility is a condition in which muscles of the digestive tract become impaired and changes in the speed, the strength, or the coordination of digestive muscles occurs. So this can happen for so many reasons. There's so many muscles and so many nerves in the GI tract. It's the second most innervated place in the body outside of the brainstem. So whenever we're talking about nerves, think of your gut and think of what your gut is going through. 
So many things can offset this nerve and muscular function. So think pelvic floor issues. The pelvic floor is known as a bowl that sits on top of our hips around the pelvis and it holds up our digestive organs, the rectum, the colon. It holds up also reproductive organs, the bladder. That's a lot to be handling. Mm -hmm. So it's no wonder that studies estimate that one in two, AKA 50% of women who have a pregnancy, not a vaginal delivery, but a pregnancy will experience some type of pelvic floor dysfunction coming off of that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So look into the pelvic floor. If you've had an injury, a groin injury, if you've had anything going on in the pelvic floor region, including years and years of holding in gas and stool, that can alter your pelvic floor muscles where either they're hypertonic and too strong, or sometimes they can become too weak and hypotonic. Um, If you've had any abdominal surgeries, hernia repair, C-sections, anything like um, any of your reproductive organs removed or altered, appendectomy, any of those can cause scar tissue, adhesions, and also they can possibly alter the other organs and the other muscles and nerves around them. So any type of abdominal surgery, scar tissue, adhesion, that can all cause dysmotility. Um, Anything that's causing nerve dysfunction, maybe that's neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Maybe that's something like a traumatic brain injury or something else. Anything that alters that nerve function. And then the nervous system also really plays into your gut motility. We do know we have something called the autonomic nervous system. It almost sounds like automatic because it kind of works automatically without us thinking about it. We're not thinking, I need to pump my heart. I need to you know, pump air through my lungs. Our autonomic nervous system is going to regulate many functions and this includes our rate of motility. And we do know when we are in a more stressed and sympathetic state, when we're in that fight, flight, mm-hmm. freeze or fun, as opposed to being in the parasympathetic, rest and digest, feed and breed, that can alter the rate of our motility. So point two, if you have any issues with any of those things that I mentioned or other things that can affect your GI, your gut motility, um, hormone imbalance, hypothyroidism, that can cause IBS and other conditions associated. And then point number three, factor number three, if you will, intestinal hyperpermeability gut barrier function. So we have all of these hollow organs that make up the GI tract and people think they're a really strong organ and very strong muscles like the heart. They're not. I um, hate to break it to you, but they're pretty thin. They're thin like skin. And so you really need to protect it. So we have this beautiful layer of thick, hopefully thick mucus that sits on top of that gut skin, that gut epithelium. And that can be very delicate. So that can easily become leaky. In the past several years, we've been hearing people talking about leaky gut. In the literature, it's called intestinal hyperpermeability. And it's a state in which that gut epithelium, that skin becomes more permeable. So instead of holding in all the contents that are in the gut, the microbes, the food we're eating, everything else that goes in there, things start to leak out and then they become more permeable into your bloodstream and they come in contact with the immune system out in the bloodstream, which is very different than the immune system inside of the gut. Um, This can be temporary. So this can actually be temporarily induced, we've shown in studies by things like high intake of saturated fat, coconut oil, palm oil, high fat dairy, high fat cuts of meat, intense exercise. They've actually shown that athletic-like exercise, athletic type exercise can actually lead to temporary leaky gut caused by something called lipopolysaccharide. Um, We know also that things like excess stress causes more inflammation in the gut and that can cause leakiness. Um, We know things like microbial overload, other factors, pesticides as well. This can also be prolonged leakiness and this can be due to dysbiosis, that imbalance of who's living where, dysmotility. Um, This can lead to many things like food intolerances, histamine response, It can lead to visceral nerve hypersensitivity of those nerves that are in and around the gut, autoimmune conditions, and so much more. So it's not taboo. It's something that we really want to be paying attention to, and it's something that we ideally want to be preventing. 
<laughs> so we've gone over what IBS, irritable bowel syndrome is. Let's talk about a subtype under that umbrella of IBS. Cause I think nothing is more unsatisfying than somebody leaving their GI office, their gastroenterologist or their primary care provider's office with the diagnosis of IBS. It's again, a disease of exclusion. It's kind of like, we can't find what else is wrong with you. So you have IBS and that's it. But there's more to that story. We do know studies show that 14 to 70, 70 percent of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, is actually something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It can also be called IMO, intestinal methanogenic overgrowth. Sometimes it's small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And we know that SIBO is caused by many different things. So even if you're diagnosed with SIBO, know that SIBO is not a root cause. You need to figure out what caused SIBO, and that could be fueling those IBS symptoms. So this could be many things low fiber, low antioxidant diet that could have gone on for years. And now suddenly you're trying to fiber fuel. You went from eating a standard American diet to trying to eat 30 plus plants per day, per week, and you're feeling it. So this could be, again, one of those issues with those three areas. It could be post-infectious gastroenteritis, again, food poisoning or traveler's diarrhea, hypothyroidism, hormone imbalance, things that affect your motility and other gut hormones, chronic constipation. It could be um, neurotransmitter dysfunction as well. We do know one of the most important neurotransmitters for motility is serotonin. That's predominantly 70 to 85% of it is made by our good gut bugs, but this could also cause symptoms of SIBO. Chronic constipation, if you're somebody who says, oh yeah, I only go have bowel movement twice a week, once a week, um, that is going to predispose you for gut bugs migrating up to the small intestine since they're not really getting enough new stuff to ferment, um, pelvic floor dysfunction, which we mentioned, ileocecal valve dysfunction, that little door between the small and large intestine, other nerve dysfunction, and many, many more. And so what are the symptoms of SIBO? Since we know not all irritable bowel syndrome is SIBO, but all SIBO is irritable bowel syndrome. So common symptoms can seem like IBS symptoms, but can sometimes be a little bit different. One of the telltale signs that most SIBO patients, not all, will experience is cumulative bloat. Most of my patients say, I wake up not very bloated, maybe a zero to two out of 10, 10 being the worst. But by the end of the day, I look and feel six months pregnant. I'm an eight to 10 out of 10 every single day by the end of the day. People ask me when I'm due. Um, so that is very much SIBO bloat. It could also include mucus in the stool. Again, loss of that protective mucus layer. It could include malodorous or trapped gas. And this isn't just, oh, my gas smells like stool or my gas smells like what I ate. This is my gas and my stool smell like an outhouse. My gas and my stool smell like rotten eggs. This is a very specific type of odor. Um, it could be change in bowel habits, constipation, diarrhea, both, or alternating. It could be loose stool with undigested food in it or spontaneous or uncomfortable belching that you don't feel like you could hold in. So again, SIBO is not a root cause diagnosis. If you don't know the cause, you need to work with your care team on it. We also know there are different types of SIBO. So getting tested so you can identify what type you have is so important. And the different types can be produced by different types of bacteria and other microbes in the gut. So we have hydrogen SIBO, which is usually produced by E. coli or Klebsiella. There's hydrogen sulfide SIBO that's produced by certain gut bugs that are called sulfur reducing. Um, there's methane IMO produced by something called archaea. And then there's small intestinal fungal overgrowth usually associated with yeast. And the symptoms can vary. With hydrogen SIBO, it's usually diarrhea, excess gas, so too fast motility. With um, hydrogen sulfide, it's usually that rotten egg smelling gas. It could include constipation, bloating, and stuck gas. Methane IMO could include constipation, diarrhea, bloat, that more methanogenic outhouse smelling gas and stool, um, and small intestinal fungal overgrowth. People could have yeast symptoms, so white coating on the tongue. They could have lots of dandruff. They could have um, white specks in their stool, belching, indigestion, nausea, and other symptoms. And so when we are seeing that those are people are suffering with these different types of small intestinal microbial overgrowth. One, we recommend getting tested. That way you know if you have it and you know how much you have. 
So the best gold standard way to get tested is during an endoscopy. Your gastroenterologist will take a sample of the fluid in the small intestine and test how much gas is in there. But we know that could be invasive and not always accessible. So the second best way is to do either an in-office or an at-home breath test in which you'll drink a substrate of either glucose or lactulose, which is glucose plus lactose, and then see how much of those gases you breathe out since it will come out in your lungs if you're feeding those gut bugs. Based on how much you have and what you have, then it's so important to work with your care team, hopefully a really well-versed registered dietitian as well, to figure out how you should be eating. Um, first, you wanna try to treat your SIBO. Then you wanna try to induce motility with a prokinetic if needed, so a pro-motility agent, and then you want to figure out what do I do. So you're going to have better rates of remission and longer remission, hopefully forever, if you're nourishing your gut in the right way. So this could include a low FODMAP, low fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. What's that mouthful mean? <laughs> They're carbohydrates. So low fermentable carbohydrate diet for you know, four to six weeks with reintroduction to really understand which ones you tolerate, which ones you don't. It could maybe include a low histamine diet if necessary. It could be a low sulfur diet if necessary, or maybe a low fermentation diet. And those <coughs> all could be good, good care options. So we're happy you're here once again because you are not running away from fiber, you're running towards fiber, which is exactly what we want to do. A lot of times, a lot of these elimination diets or what we call medical nutrition ther and therapy diets or therapeutic diets are something you do short term, but we're finding a larger and larger set of the population are doing them for longer and longer periods, essentially eliminating these great carbohydrates, these FODMAPs, which we want to eat, FODMAPs are good. A lot of these components in, in food, which are carbohydrate based, are good. And we want to eat them for a healthy and robust microbiome long term. So again, what we, like, we would like to reiterate is it's not the food's fault, right? We're not here to blame food. We're not here to say it's the broccoli, it's the kale, it's the grains. We got to eliminate all the grains and we got to eliminate all the cruciferous vegetables and we have to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. You know, what you're eating today and what you're eating even 10 years ago is not always the main and primary root cause culprit, right? There are many, many factors as Dahlia has gone over. It's very important that today's gut symptoms are not always just about today's food, right? Your gut has been building over the course of decades and even back in your mother's womb, right? Mm -hmm. And even before that, your mother was giving you her microbiome. So what happened when you were not even born yet matters in your gut health picture. But the good news is, is that you can heal with each meal. You can reshape your gut and you can help to introduce healthier foods. An analogy we like to give for this is a debt analogy, right? Mm -hmm. We're all familiar with debt, I, I think. Uh, we've all kind of been there, whether it's a student loan or a credit card or you're taking out a mortgage. SIBO and IBS can feel a lot like debt or even other GI issues, right? You've kind of been building up debt for the last couple of decades, right? Whether it's more spending than usual, credit cards, and you've really found yourself in a bad spot. Maybe you're having a number of those symptoms Dahlia mentioned, gas and bloating and recurrent diarrhea or a combination of diarrhea and constipation. And so it's important to understand that's a lot like getting those debt notices in the mail, right? And what a lot of people out there are telling you to do essentially is going, hey, let's rip up those, those notices. Let's change your phone number so the creditors don't call you. Change your email and change your address so they don't know where you are. There you go, we solved the problem. Your, your SIBO and IBS, you're all better now. You're avoiding fiber and FODMAPs and histamine foods. And we're gonna demonize the anti-nutrients, the phytates and all those things, Ugh, just avoid them that's very much like avoiding your debt. Instead, what we're saying is, let's face your debt head on, right? Let's come up with an action plan. Let's come up with a budget and go, this money and this debt was used for a purpose, but let's get it under control, right? Let's pay off the debt. Let's get your credit back where it needs to be so you can buy that house and buy that car and be super productive and healthy and get you to a healthy place with your finances. And such an important part of that analogy is figuring out how you got in debt in the first place so you don't yes. find yourself back there over and over and over again. So right. we hope that these strategies are gonna help you get out of your gut debt. 
Yes. So uh, very important is to understand, again, this health story. How did you get here? What happened in your health story? You can even go back, and I know what Dahlia does with her patients, is go back to the first 1,000 days of life. Were you breastfed? Were you born vaginally? How were you eating as a young child? What medications were you on? What did you suffer with? And really go back and take some time to kind of review and understand, was there stress and trauma in the home? I know I, I grew up in a traumatic and stressful household. How did that affect my health? Where did that come from? How, what did I use to cope with that? A lot of times we use food to cope with those things and then we go down a rabbit hole there and, and develop more and more kind of stress responses for that. What, are we properly analyzing these aspects of our health? So the way we do that is by a, a keeping a food mood and poop journal. Say that five times fast. So with that, we're analyzing, you know, what are you eating? How is it making you feel? And then how is it making your body feel, right? So what are the emotions? What are the thoughts tied to that? Very, very important aspects of your healing journey. And then of course, blood work and breath tests and other great indicators and lab values that can help you understand what's going on. And then finally with that, you want a knowledgeable and compassionate team to help you understand all of this, to even help you understand and read your blood work and breath test and understand that, you know, there aren't always these band-aid solutions of like, okay, I'm going to see my doctor for five minutes. Here's a pill. Goodbye. See you in six months. No, let's take some more time. Let's understand the triggers. Let's understand, you know, is it gluten? Is it dairy? Histamines, FODMAPs sulfur rich foods there's many many factors to this and and this is important to really have a really knowledgeable registered dietitian and well-rounded care team to help guide you through this so here's some quick do's and don'ts when it comes to helping with SIBO and IBS and overall helping with a healthy and nourished gut microbiome so some do's obviously a diversity of plants Diversity of plants gives you diversity of nutrients as well as a diversity of microbes. We are obtaining our microbes from our environment, including foods, right? So we want those colors, we want those antioxidants, we want that diversity. And that's even possible if you are on an elimination diet. We can't yes. tell you how many people come to us on an elimination diet and they're only eating a handful of foods. There's so many low FODMAP foods, there's so many low histamine foods, there's so many low sulfur foods. So even if you are on one of those elimination diets, Diversify as much as you possibly can. And then proper hydration. So are you drinking enough water? Are you drinking enough water and eating enough water in your food, which is very, very important? Are you getting enough movement? Are you moving daily? I know I sit in front of a screen quite a bit, so I am very, very mindful with how much I'm moving to the point where we have a treadmill desk and I have a bicycle desk. So if I am sitting for long periods, I start cycling or Delia starts walking on her treadmill desk. Stress reduction, right? Are you meeting whether you have a spouse or a significant other? Are you guys meeting together and doing something to relieve stress? Are you relieving stress as a family? Are you working with maybe someone in your care team that helps you work through your thoughts and anxiety and stress and really come to terms with it and understand it and face it head on? Sleep uh, is very important. Uh, that's all, That could be a whole talk in and of itself, but are you sleeping enough? I cannot, cannot uh, stress that enough eating on a schedule, especially when it comes to SIBO and IBS. So you're not just kind of picking and grazing throughout the entire day, but eating on a set schedule can be very, very important. Alcohol and other substances you want to minimize, if not eliminate. And then a healthy relationship with food as well as a community is very, very important. And it's not just the quality of the food and what you're eating to heal with each meal. We really take it further and encourage you to feel with each meal. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to heal a body that you resent, that you dislike, that you're frustrated with, especially when you're trying to do that using foods you're afraid of or have an unhealthy relationship with. And it sounds odd to say that, but it really is a relationship with food because these foods are living in your home. They're like a roommate. So you really want to ask yourself, How's my relationship with this food? Is it roommate status? Do we have a great relationship? It's something that I want to see every single day without causing stress, without causing guilt, without causing me discomfort. Maybe it's not. Maybe your relationship's fine, but you're like, mm, 
I don't want to live with you. I think it would ruin our relationship. I think I can see you every once in a while, but if I saw you every single day, it would cause some of that stress and some of that um, guilt or other unhealthy feelings. So maybe I'm just going to visit you when I'm at a restaurant or on the weekends, but I'm not going to see you every day. You're not roommate status. Maybe your relationship with certain foods is strained. You had unpleasant memories from eating this as a child, or it's not really one that you feel really great around every single day. So you're like, mm, I'll see you on the holidays maybe, or I'll see you every once in a while. I need to do some work before I get you back in my life. And there are certain foods that maybe are toxic, right? Toxic for you, just like relationships can be toxic. So that could be foods you're allergic to. Um, that could be foods that really just make you feel awful and you maybe just need to go no contact with them at this mm -hmm. time and work with someone who's knowledgeable to see can we repair some of these relationships and can all of these become roommates or do some need to still be kept at bay a little bit mm -hmm. um, so with all that said we wanted to provide you with encouragement because this can sound like a lot mm -hmm. but with 10 years of experience and working with thousands and thousands of GI patients, helping them maintain a plant-based diet, since we are plant-based dietitians, we wanted to share some real patient experiences. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna share three case studies today and hope that it gives you some more hope in this journey. Um, first, we have JM. She's a 48-year-old female. She came to me, she was having gut issues for 22 years, and they actually happened overnight after mold exposure during travel. She went from having great gut health no issues to being in her you know early adulthood and then suddenly overnight she was traveling mold gut issues she said she was often doubled over in pain and she had to alter her outfits she could no longer wear pants or even leggings she had to just wear robes dresses and loose fitting clothing and this was hard for her because she's a professional dancer um, but she would do that due to pain she was afraid to eat and she said she really only felt okay when she was not eating. So she dreaded eating. She would skip breakfast and try to eat later on in the day so she wasn't in pain. She had no relief after over a decade of symptoms, uh, over two decades actually. She saw multiple gastroenterologists, nutritionists, functional medicine providers, naturopaths. She made very few nutrition tweaks because she didn't know what to do. And then she came to me and we identified what the issue was. She, me and her care team, her care team and I worked together to really try to identify the root. And it was in fact yeast overgrowth. Um, she was put on some prescription antifungals from her care team. We got in some probiotic foods and certain strains of microbes like Saccharomyces boulardii. We played around with her fiber intake and her nutrients. We provided her with motility support in her colon, her liver, her gallbladder. And she said it was the best she's ever felt in 22 years. She took a trip to New York and she said she was able to eat a lot of foods that she previously could not eat every time she and her husband had visited there in the past. So it was life-changing for her. Um, patient number two is CS, a 33-year-old female, gut issues her entire life. She said from womb, she was a colicky baby, gut issues from day one. She always had an anxious personality because she had early childhood trauma. She had an eating disorder at a very young age that carried on throughout her life. She said she initially went plant-based and felt better until she felt much worse. And then that's when she came to me. She's like, I don't know what to do. I've tried so many things. So we worked together. We got her a SIBO and IBS diagnosis. We worked on some personalized medical nutrition therapy and actually a few iterations of things that we tried and um, combined a few things. She got on the right treatment. Um, we corrected some nutritional deficiencies that were there. She actually got into pelvic floor therapy and found that that was very important for her. She did some gut-directed hypnotherapy on an app, and she said she had the best relationship with food she's ever had in her whole life after that, and her symptoms were almost completely resolved. She lived overseas. I haven't seen her in a while, and that makes me happy because she sent me a message saying, I'm good. I don't need you anymore. And that's my favorite thing. Our goal is to not see our patients yes. after, after some time. <laughs> so patient three, um, Dee Dee, is a 26-year-old female. She had gut issues since she was a teenager, since she moved to the United States from Jordan. So immigration is also a risk factor. You're taking in a new microbiome from a completely different climate. After a few years of being here, she was diagnosed with colitis, microscopic colitis, which is not in, it's not an autoimmune condition. It's not ulcerative colitis, it's microscopic. 
she would have excruciating menstrual cycles to the point where she would miss work for the first two days of her period every month. She had tons of food fear because she recognized also when she ate, she felt worse. And so she and I worked together. We found out what was working for her, what was not. I encouraged her to get linked in with an endometriosis knowledgeable care team. And in fact, she was diagnosed with endometriosis. Um, we then began to notice that really she only needed to tweak her nutrition around certain times of her menstrual cycle when her estrogen was at its highest. We introduced certain foods like cruciferous vegetables and broccoli sprouts to bring down her excessive estrogen. We worked on her gut health. We got, got her on some probiotic foods first and some probiotic capsules. We used fiber and antioxidants. She had a better relationship with food, much less food fear. And then she and I went on to another layer of working on environmental toxins in, on, and around her body. She stopped missing work every month. Her periods were no longer debilitating and her colitis resolved because it was as a result of inflammation in her gut and inflammation in her uterus from the endometriosis. So these are just a few instances that we have to share, um, but this is our passion, just as it's a passion of so many providers out there. So if you, this resonates with you, any of these symptoms, any of these things we've said, get linked in with someone who can help you. And really our approach and this approach that Dahlia is mentioning and what you've heard thus far is really an integrative approach. We are not just here to go, oh, you have some gas and bloating and constipation. Let's treat that. Yes, that's important, but we also want to ask, why is that there? What can we do to dive deeper and understand that? So some of our services, again, make sure you're connecting with us. There will be links where you can sign up for our waitlist for our SIBO IBS program, where we're going to dive deeper into SIBO and IBS. If you've been dealing with that, definitely connect with us there. And through our practice, Married to Health, we have a total of seven different integrative dietitians with different specialties We're where you can work based. with them one-on-one -on -one. they're plant-based you can see our our e-guides you can see our other courses coming down the line you can do meal plans and beyond we've worked with a lot of great people over the years and we do a lot of fun things with different companies we like we also like to curate different brands and curate different items to help with gut health whether you're gluten-free whether you do have SIBO IBS and beyond uh, and to the fact, uh, to the point where Dahlia formulated our gut nurture supplement. And with gut nurture, we really, really use this for our SIBO IBS patients. It is really formulated and tailored for SIBO IBS patients. Low FODMAP, low histamine, low sulfur. Yes. So connect with us. And 